Where would you rather see $500 billion invested? Would you build infrastructure for economic development, fund nutrition and education programs, invest in technology to avert climate change and improve energy security? Every year, governments spend this sum on something else entirely. Globally, around $500 billion is used each year to subsidize fossil fuels for energy consumers. Subsidies for fossil fuels by governments take many forms. Some forego revenue by introducing tax breaks for fuel products. Or they underprice energy, charging less money for energy than it costs to produce, not making enough money back to maintain and reinvest in energy infrastructure. Others mandate energy companies to keep their prices below actual cost, without compensation. Some keep prices low with direct payments out of the budget. However, subsidies can have a range of adverse impacts. They cost a lot, a serious opportunity cost, in some countries causing debt and fiscal crises, worth an average of 5.4% of GDP and around 20% of total government expenditure. They are a liability. When fossil fuel prices go up, so does the cost of subsidizing fuel. They are usually regressive. Most benefit the rich more than the poor. Only a small share of fossil fuel subsidies reach the lowest quintile. They are often inefficient. The same money could make a much bigger impact if it was spent in different ways. They can reduce investment in the energy sector. Low prices make the sector unattractive to investors. This was the case in Russia, where the so-called Chubay's Cross was used to dramatically illustrate how electricity demand could theoretically grow at the same rate that supply declined. They can slow adoption of renewable energy. They increase the price gap between fossil and renewable energy. In Egypt, one study found that underpricing of gas was a serious problem for wind power. If gas was priced at the mid-range of its possible market values, gas and wind power in the country would be close to similar costs. They can fuel corruption and cause smuggling and illegal diversion of subsidized liquid fuels. Finally, they increase greenhouse gas emissions and local air pollution because cheap fossil fuel prices incentivize people to use more fossil fuels and not to switch to alternatives. Fossil fuel subsidies may cause problems, but they are also an opportunity to reallocate fiscal resources into development in ways that are sustainable. Reducing, improving, or entirely removing subsidies is a process known as subsidy reform. We can free up funds for other development priorities, remove a fiscal liability, and reallocate expenditure more efficiently so that less money is needed to help businesses and households more effectively. We can spur investment in the energy sector, particularly improving the potential for investments in renewable energy. We can also reduce opportunities for corruption, smuggling, and illegal diversion of fossil fuels and significantly reduce greenhouse gas emissions and local air pollution. In sum, if done correctly, fossil fuel subsidy reform can have powerful fiscal, economic, environmental, and social benefits. If fossil fuel subsidy reform is such a great idea, why isn't everybody doing it? One simple reason. Reform is often difficult. Fossil fuels and electricity generated using fossil fuels is a major economic input. Reforming subsidies can affect prices, businesses, and households throughout an economy. There are two major hurdles to reform. There is a technical challenge in making sure reform is well-planned and does not have unintended impacts. And a political challenge in helping people understand and accept change. How can we increase the likelihood of success? There is no one strategy for all countries. 
But there are some key ingredients to help countries gear up for fossil fuel subsidy reform in a way that helps vulnerable groups, provides a politically acceptable solution to industry and middle classes, and provides a long-term solution. Countries can prepare in three areas. One, how fuels are priced and subsidies are targeted. Two, how the impacts of reform can be managed. And three, how to build the support so the political space exists in which reform is possible. Even if the opportunity to reform seems a long way off, beginning these preparations early in all three areas at the same time can allow countries to act decisively and effectively when the time is ripe. Pricing and targeting focuses on how fuels are priced. This touches on at least four dimensions of pricing. How subsidies are given and how big they are whether international price changes are fully reflective in domestic price changes, and whether price rules are transparent and fully enforced. A system to ensure that prices are market-based and change automatically is the first step to introducing lasting change. Another important issue is the pace of reform. How much will prices change and when? Generally, slow reform is easier to prepare for, and gives more room to adapt the strategy in light of the real impacts of change. But fast reform may be the only option if subsidy costs need to be reduced quickly or political opposition is too high to allow for many small changes. Preparation to manage the impacts of reform may be necessary to protect households and vulnerable businesses from the shock of price changes. Countries can prepare for this by projecting the impacts of reform. Who will be affected and how? How much? Qualitative research and quantitative research can explore these questions. Governments and other stakeholders can then decide on mitigation measures to help reduce or compensate for negative impacts. Finally, governments can work to build support for fossil fuel subsidy reform in a collaborative manner. This involves internal coordination. Are all relevant ministries working together and sharing information? Are they speaking with one voice? It also involves consultation and communications. Consultation can achieve many things. It helps gather information government may not already have. It can reveal how reform and mitigation measures are perceived. It can be used to help design appropriate reforms and mitigation measures, and it can raise awareness. Consultation can help governments build credibility in the eyes of stakeholders groups that they will indeed provide the support that they have promised during and after reform. Consultations also imply a degree of negotiation. Will the government respond to stakeholder needs and concerns? Can this build buy-in to a reform plan? Communications focus on raising awareness, first about subsidies, informing people about cost, impacts, and who benefits, countering misconceptions, and comparing international experience. Second, about reform, how it is projected to affect stakeholders, how the government will protect the vulnerable, and when changes will happen. An integrated approach is needed while preparing for reform. Research, internal planning, consultations, and communications need to be threaded together so that each supports and is supported by the others. For more information, including case studies, advice on methodologies and resources, see the Global Subsidy Initiative Study, a guidebook to fossil fuel subsidy reform, and the World Bank's publications, Reforming Fuel Pricing in an Age of $100 Oil, and Petroleum Product Pricing and Complementary Policies, Experience of 65 Developing Countries Since 2009. The web address for these three papers can be found at the links shown on screen.